now we're, we'll, we're very happy to, ha to have Daniele Dorigoni speaking about modular graph functions and asymptotic expansions of Poincaré series. Thank you. Thank you, Nesha. Um, great. So, yes, I'm going to be talking about some work I've been doing together with uh, Axel, uh, and it actually happened after the, um, the meeting two years ago, three years ago, I don't know. So I want to talk a little bit about um, two particular instances of modularity um, in string theory. So in particular, there's going to be two types of objects, one constructed from a worksheet point of view, which goes under the name of modular graph functions, and another one which can be seen from the space-time point of view and is going to produce another set of modular invariant functions. And they can be understood as coefficient functions of some low energy effective action coming from string theory. So let me start with the first example, uh, just to set up a little bit uh, um, the ideas behind. So as probably a lot of people in the audience know, when we have to compute some, uh, say, endpoint amplitudes, for example, in this case, uh, with my beautiful uh, Photoshop skills, I printed a four graviton amplitude. Um, we want to do a sum over all genuses, or all Riemann surfaces with a fixed genus, so zero, one, two, and so on. So in particular, if we focus on the genus one case, like a torus amplitude, we want somehow to take into account all the different Riemann surfaces. So in particular, we want to integrate over the complex structure tau. However, even if you give me two different taus, they don't necessarily mean that uh, you're drawing a different torus. If two complex structures are related by tau prime is equal to gamma times tau, with gamma an SL to Z matrix, then this produces the same torus. So this will lead to um, modular invariance of some sort of integrand. So just to give you a little bit more details, uh, let's stick again to the four-point amplitude. Doesn't really matter, but it's just for simplicity. So how does the four-point amplitude on the torus look like? Well, we have two pieces. So the first piece in here is what I just said before. We want to sum over all possible genus one surfaces. So we're gonna have an integral over the complex structure and it's gonna be representing the fundamental domain of SL to Z. So if you take two tau leaves in here, different, they do correspond to the two different tori. So we really need to sum over all of them. We need to integrate over all of them. And then we're gonna have another bunch of stuff. So we have, in this case, as I said, it's a four point amplitude. So we're gonna have four vertex operators inserted at four insertion points, Z1 to Z4. And we want to integrate over the insertion points, modding out some SL to Z action. So as I said before, since two tori with different tau, but related in this way, are actually the same torus, then the integral should be a modular invariant. So this will produce something which, if you take a modular transformation of tau, remains invariant. And it's uh, uh, no surprise that uh, you can compute it in very few cases. However, as I'm gonna show in a second, it's computable in an alpha prime expansion. And the expansion of this integral over the four insertion points will produce a bunch of functions which are gonna be invariant under the cell to Z, and they're usually called modular graph functions. So just to give you a little bit more details, I'm not really going to enter, enter so much into these details of the calculation. I'm just going to study the objects that are popping out. But as I was saying, if I compute this integrand, we fix uh, all the gauge fixing, fixed cost, and so on. At the end of the day, we want to integrate over the insertion points of these four operators. And then we have the, this, what is called Cobanilson factor in which these SIJ are nothing but the Mandelstam variables for the um, external operators. So each one of these operators will carry some momenta, some polarization. I don't care at all about the polarization. The momenta are encoded in the Mandelstam variables. And this G is nothing but the torus green function, which you can write in terms of some um, Jacobi theta. I prefer to write it in this Fourier sums because of the expression I'm gonna write in a second. And in here, I simply wrote every insertion point as a linear combination of something in the tau direction plus something in the, let's say, one direction of the torus. So 
if you expand this exponent in alpha prime, you see that alpha prime sits in here. So when you expand it, you basically can draw some sort of Feynman-like rules that were studied by this gentleman in here. And you can obtain a diagrammatic expansion of this integrand order by order in alpha prime after we have integrated over the insertion points. So the kind of objects you're gonna get, as I mentioned before, they are modular invariant and they're called modular graph function and take this form, a lattice sum. So you see in here why I brought the propagator in this way, the green function. You see that this corresponds to having three propagators. Well, actually, this is a propagator of a certain momentum m1 in the direction tau and momentum m1, and I actually put three of them. And then another propagator of momentum m2 and tau and momentum m2. And then by conservation of momentum, the final momentum is fixed. So these are the typical objects that you're getting out of this expansion. They're written as lattice sums and they're not particularly illuminating. However, uh, we're gonna study them in a completely different way um, shortly. The important thing is that they will be modular invariant. If you take tau and send it to gamma tau, this object does not transform. As I mentioned before, there is another type of um, modularity that I want to discuss about, just because we can discuss both of them simultaneously, and it's related to uh, the U-duality group. So if we take, for example, type 2B in 10 dimension, there is another SL2Z action which acts on the space-time. So it really acts on the axial dilaton. You combine the axion and the dilaton in this way, there is another SL2Z that modifies Z in this form. AZ plus B over CZ plus D, where again, the matrix gamma is an LZ to Z matrix. So if you want, this is really related to usual S duality, because if you take the S transformation in here, it really takes the coupling, the string coupling G and send it to minus one over G. In general, I'm not gonna be talking about that, but if you consider type to be compactified, then uh, the U-duality group actually gets a little bit more interesting, it gets bigger, uh, and there's a very interesting class of automorphic forms in here, but I'm not gonna be talking about them. The in interesting thing um, for us, it's gonna be that if we start from uncompactified type to be in 10 dimension, this SL to Z will be preserved order by order in the low energy expansion. So if we study string theory and we want to look at the low energy expansion, we're gonna be producing type 2B supergravity plus corrections. These corrections can be arranged in more and more derivatives. So in here, I'm schematically writing up R4, then this is gonna be D4R4, D6R4, plus an infinite tower of higher derivative interactions. Each one of them is weighted by some alpha prime and by a coefficient function that really depends on the web of the axial dilator. As I mentioned before, there is this SL to Z action, which is preserved order by order, which means that all of these functions, FR4 of tau, FD4 R4 of tau, and so on, will be modular invariant. In particular, I would like to mention this uh, beautiful uh, results, uh, uh, very recent by uh, these people, where actually they computed certain combination of these functions from really from an n equal to four uh, supersymmetric localization point of view. And they were able to get both the perturbative and the non-perturbative parts encoded in the partition function plus some other stuff, but I thought it was a very beautiful result. Good, so for us, we want to study these two type of object. So the worksheet modular graph functions for which tau will really be the worksheet torus modulus and the space-time coefficient functions for which tau will really be the axial dilaton. So whenever I'm talking about tau, if you prefer, you can either think of tau of a, mod, of a torus or the inverse string coupling. The thing that we want to do is how do we study this um, SL to Z invariant functions of tau? And the way to do it is that in both cases, actually, there is some underlying Laplacian equation behind. So both cases have a structure of this form, either a modular graph function or one of these higher derivative corrections which I told you about, satisfies something like Laplacian minus some eigenvalue applied to F 
equal to some source term, some modular invariant source term, where the Laplacian is the SL to Z invariant Laplacian. So the origin of this differential equation is completely different. So we are really talking about two different objects when we are talking about modular graph functions or um, higher derivative corrections. So from the worksheet point of view, well, you just, uh, it's, it's complicated, but like I gave you before one of these expression in terms of a lattice sum, act on this lattice sum with a Laplacian and you will see that there is some structure like this behind. While instead from the space-time space -time point of view, this equation really comes from some supersymmetric constraints um, that were derived, for example, uh, studying from 11 dimensions. So I don't care so much about the origins of this differential equation, I care about studying the solution to this differential equation. So just to give you concrete examples for this example, C311 modular graph function that I wrote you before, the Laplace equation looks like Laplace minus six equal to this stuff in here. While instead for the D6R4 coefficient, the equation looks like Laplace minus 12 applied to this um, higher derivative coefficient equal to e3 half squared. So in here you see these objects e appearing, these are just standard modular invariant non-holomorphic Eisenstein series. And you see it takes exactly this form, Laplacian minus an eigenvalue equal to some source term. The question is, well, how do we solve this equation? We want to start from this differential equation as some sort of uh, uh, common starting point to learn about the functions that we are trying to understand, being that modular graph functions or these higher derivative coefficients. And there's a lot of methods. The one I would like to talk about um, today is the use of Poincaré series plus a little bit of resurgence. All right, so how do we start? Well, uh, we're gonna be using this method that was applied to um, modular graph function, higher derivative correction by Axel and his collaborator. And the idea is fairly neat. So uh, before, before even doing in here, so the idea is very simple. So how do we construct a function invariant under some group? Say for example, translation. Well, we could start with one over X squared and we make it by force invariant under translation. So we could sum over all N and we translate X. So if you do the sum over one over X plus N squared, this will produce for you a, um, a periodic function. What we do in here, we do exactly the same thing to construct a function which is invariant under cell to Z. So suppose that the source term has, uh, can be written in terms of a Poincaré series, which takes this form. We sum over all the images of a cell to Z, rho of gamma of tau. So as I said before, this function, uh, this auxiliary function rho, we evaluated at all the images under SL to Z. Clearly the object that we are getting out is gonna be SL to Z invariant. There is a little subtlety in here, we really need to mod out by the stabilizer of the cusp. So in all of our cases, rho is gonna be a, a periodic function. So we don't want to sum over infinitely many trivial images because being invariant, if we act with the uh, Borel group, this actually is gonna be rho of tau plus n, but this is equal to rho of tau, so this sum would diverge. So we mod out by the stabilizer of the cusp, and we basically sum over all the images under a cell to z, and we produce a modular invariant term. So we make the same answer for the function f. We're gonna assume that the function f can be written as a sum over images of some auxiliary function which I'm gonna be calling the seed function. And instead of solving for S, we are gonna to try to solve for sigma. So just to combine everything together, this is the equation that we want to solve. I write the source as a sum over images of rho. I write the unknown function F as a sum over images C, the seed. And the equation, since the Laplacian is a cell to Z invariant, becomes Laplacian minus eigenvalue applied to the seed equal to rho. Why would we do that? Well, two reasons. First is that this problem is genetically easier to solve than our starting problem. However, sorry, however, we wanted to find f. So clearly we need to have a way to go backward. 
if I solve for the seed, I should be able to reconstruct F. And this is indeed the case. We can, once you find the seed, we can reconstruct the function that we started with, the function that we really wanted to understand, starting from the seed. So just to give you an example of this procedure, if we start from this modular graph function equation that I wrote you before, and you apply this technique that I told you, so we write C311 as a sum over images of the seed, then you see that the differential equation becomes a little bit simpler. In particular, there was a term in here involving two Eisenstein series. Once we play this trick, you see that on the right-hand side, there is just a power of tau, another power of tau. Uh, don't worry about this epsilon. This is just a regulator for this constant term. It doesn't really matter. But the strange term, well, not strange, let's say the most difficult term, which was this E2, E3, gets simplified to E2 times the power of tau. So this Laplacian equation is way easier to solve than this Laplacian equation in here. And the reason why we did that is because these objects appearing in here, these non-holomorphic Eisenstein series, have a very neat representation in this Poincaré sum. So this is the usual definition of the non-holomorphic Eisenstein series as a lattice sum. But we can write it as a sum of images, as I just told you, of something very simple. Just imagine a part of gamma tau to the power s. So this is why you see that going from this Laplace equation to the one for the seed, all of these, or at least some of these Eisenstein series disappear and they're replaced just by a power of tau. So this equation is way easier to solve than the starting one. So we can actually solve it. I'm not gonna tell you how to do it, it's very simple. We just decompose the seed in Fourier modes and we solve it Fourier mode by Fourier mode. So the zero Fourier mode is just a polynomial of tau. I couldn't even be bothered writing it down. It's not illuminating at all. The interesting thing happens for the non-zero Fourier mode. So forget this constant in here, the non-zero Fourier mode, you start having this object in here, sigma minus three of n. We start having these divisor sums. So sigma with little s index s of n, Please uh, do not confuse this divisor sum with the seed function. They are completely different objects. Hopefully it's gonna be clear in the context. The divisor sum is just a sum over all the divisors of n, d to the power s. And then you see that the Fourier mode takes simply this divisor sigma minus three, some powers of the imaginary part of tau and some exponentially suppressed term. So usually, the Laplace equation for the seed is easier to solve than the Laplace equation that we really wanted to solve. The key point is, how do we go back? So what does this tell us? We solve for the seed, but remember, we still wanted to study this modular graph function or higher derivative coefficients. So what does this seed tell us for the C311? Well, if we start from this function f written as a seed, and we solve for the seed, how do we go back to the Fourier coefficients for the function f? So for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on how to reconstruct just the zero mode, so something which does not have tau one, and I'm gonna be keep on calling it the topologically trivial sector because I'm gonna keep on thinking of as tau one has a theta angle. So I'm really thinking as the different Fourier modes as being different topological sectors or different instanton sectors. So even if I focus on the zero mode, so something which is theta independent, A0 of tau two, I'm still expecting it to have some perturbative expansion plus instanton anti-instanton corrections. And there is actually a way, I'm not gonna tell you how, but there is a way to reconstruct the zero mode of F given all the Fourier mode of the sigma, of the seed. And the expression is this one. It's beautiful and it's gonna disappear in a second. The key point that I wanted to make is that if you found a solution for the seed, you can actually reconstruct the zero mode of the, um, of the function that you really wanted to study, this f of tau. For the non-zero mode, this is still true, but they're way more complicated. They really start involving some uh, this 
objects called cluster sums, uh, but in principle, you can still reconstruct all the modes of F out of all the modes of sigma. So for me, I'm just gonna try to reconstruct the zero mode of our higher, higher derivative corrections or modular graph functions. And in particular, I want to obtain the weak coupling expansion tau two going to infinity for either the modular graph functions or these low energy coefficients. So again, uh, be careful, the tau appearings are completely different in nature. For modular graph functions, tau is really the worship torus. So this is just tau two going to infinity is just the cusp, is some degeneration limit of the torus. The reason why I keep on calling weak coupling is that instead from the Walsh, sorry, from the space-time point of view, tau is the axiodilaton. So this limit is really the weak coupling limit in which you're sending the string coupling to zero. So the nature of the non-perturbative corrections is gonna be completely different, but I'm still gonna be referring to them as instant on anti-instant on in both cases. Although technically speaking, only the space-time case we should really be talking about instant on anti instantons So, um, as I said, I'm just gonna focus on zero mode. So I'm just gonna try to understand the topologically trivial sector. So the sector that does not depend on the theta angle, theta angle in here being tau one of the torus. And actually with Axel, we studied something a little bit more general. So we started, so if you see the seed solution that I gave you before, it took this particular form. However, we realized that um, if we study a seed form of this type, so the Fourier mode takes some general divisor sigma with index A, some general power of N, power B, and some general power of tau two, power R. This type of seed, um, we can reconstruct a lot of modular graph functions and uh, all the uh, higher derivative coefficients um, that uh, are coming from the space-time point of view. So we study the weak coupling expansion for the zero mode A0 of this function F using this particular seeds. And okay, um, I'm gonna keep the details to a minimum. So we, I told you there is this expression to reconstruct the zero mode out of all the Fourier modes you plug in this seed that I just told you about, and so you want to study the weak coupling expansion of this object in here. Um, the only thing I would like you to appreciate is that in this expression in here, there's a lot of sums appearing. The important thing that we realize is that tau two, let's say the coupling constant or inverse coupling constant, only appears in the expression m over tau two, m over tau two. So after a little bit of money or a lot of manipulations, we realize that actually we can rewrite this expression in a form that makes the weak coupling expression, uh, expansion more treatable. So we were able to rewrite this object in here as a sum over infinitely many m of some function phi, some auxiliary function, evaluated at shifted coupling m plus h t, where t is one over tau two. So we were asking about the asymptotic expansion of an object of this form when t goes to zero. So the reason why I spent a little bit of time, I could have just given you the asymptotic expansion. I just wanted to mention a neat trick. Uh, how am I doing with time? Uh, okay, I have enough time. So I wanted to um, give you a neat trick due to uh, Don Zagia, uh, which we thought it was uh, really pretty. So uh, this is something very general. If you are asking about the asymptotic expansion of an object of this form, again, phi is some function, which has some nice expansion around the origin. So the expansion around the origin of phi is this guy in here. And you're asking yourself, what is the asymptotic expansion around the origin of an infinite sums in which the coupling constant T is shifted, or let's say multiplied by integers, plus some little shift H? Well, the asymptotic expansion of this object takes the form i phi over t, so there is a singular term, plus an infinite series of the same coefficients bn around the origin, times the Hurwitz zeta minus n of this parameter h, t to the n. So the origin of these two terms is actually very neat. This first term in here is what Zagier calls the Riemann term. So 
if you see what we are doing here when t goes to zero, well, if you think about uh, calculus one, that was a long time ago for many of us, but hopefully still in, in your memory. So how were we computing an integral? Well, we were taking an infinitesimal step, evaluating the function of that step, a twice that step, three times that step, and summing over all of these values. So you see that this first term is actually just coming because this expression in here is literally the Riemann integral definition. However, this is not the end of the story. There is also this other term in here, this asymptotic series. This term in here can also be understand, understood from a, well, from a physics perspective, this would be the first thing you would actually do. You would plug this expansion in here and change the summations. So you see, if I plug this expansion, I'm gonna start getting m plus h to the power n. If I sum over m, I get the Hurwitz zeta. So, Zagier proved that actually these two terms give you the correct asymptotic expansion for the object in here. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention this, um, this trick just because I thought it was uh, particularly nice. And given the uh, conference uh, is all about resurgence and asymptotic method, I thought it would fit nicely with the audience. So if you don't care about asymptotics, then don't worry. We use some trick and we were able to get from this ugly expansion in here, we're able to get the asymptotic expansion around the origin for the zero Fourier mode of C311 and the zero Fourier mode, for example, of the D6R4 coefficient. So in here, I'm just using change of variable y pi tau 2. So you get an expression of this form and you start seeing some nice coefficients appearing, odd zeta values. And in this case, you get this expansion in here for the D6R4. And note that they didn't put any dot, dot, dot. The reason is that this asymptotic expansion terminates. So this is the truncated perturbative expansion. In all of these cases, we find a truncating perturbative expansion, but we're still expecting to have some non-perturbative physics behind. So with Axel, we wanted to try and understand if it was possible actually to reconstruct the non-perturbative corrections hidden beyond this perturbative expansion? And the answer is yes, and we had to use uh, Cheshire Cat Resurgence, name that was introduced by this, I think it was in this paper that they call it uh, Cheshire Cat, uh, by people very likely in, uh, in the audience right now. Also, probably Disney is going to ban my talk because of inappropriate use of their material. But anyway, I like this picture. So Cheshire Cat Resurgence um, is actually something very neat that happens in a lot of supersymmetric cases, let's say. So whenever we get some truncating expansion, we can in most cases deform it slightly. So in particular, let me go back to the C311 case. In red, I'm presenting in here the correct solution, the one that gives rise to a truncating perturbative expansion. So we added this little deformation. This was one of the seed that I told you that we studied in general. So I just added a small deformation and at the end, I'm gonna be considering the limit b going to zero. So this term disappears. What does it happen? Well, we repeated this trick by Zagia to compute the asymptotic expansion um, from the seed to the contribution of the zero mode. And it takes this form in here. So there is a term, what I call I perturbative, which reproduces, it reduces to this truncating expansion that I gave you in here. So this term is the only one that should survive when we send B to its physical value. However, if we do things carefully, we see that the full contribution involves also this other series in here. And note that this series has two properties. So first of all, you see that there is in front a sine pi B. So this is exactly the tail of the Cheshire cat. When B goes to zero, the tail disappears, just like the cat. However, the series in here, it's an asymptotic series. So in here, there is just a bunch of zetas. Zetas, they behave like one when n goes to infinity. In here, we just need to count factorials. So we have a factorial, another factorial, divided by a factorial. These coefficients are growing factorially. So what did we do with this object? Well, we would like to forget for a second the Cheshire cat tail in here 
and apply just Borel resummation to try and understand a little bit the non-perturbative corrections. However, distance in here makes our life a little bit complicated because you could try to do the Borel transform. Uh, however, you cannot get it in closed form if you get these coefficients. But the nice thing is that this particular coefficient can be rewritten in a very nice way using the Dirichlet series. So this ratio of zetas can actually be written as an infinite sums of two divisor sigmas and m to the power m. The reason to do that is because we can rewrite this asymptotic tail in a way simpler form by getting rid of this, if you want, algebraic type of, well, not algebraic, but this sort of uh, um, number theoretical coefficient. So we get rid of this by using the Dirichlet series. And now our asymptotic tails takes the form of a sum over m due to the Dirichlet series and a very simple now asymptotic series. The only thing that we have done by taking care of this coefficient, you see that now we are getting an asymptotic series in which the coupling constant y is actually rescaled by m. But now the coefficients are just purely factorial. Note also that in here, in all of these, apart from the sign, I set b to zero. So I could have kept b different from zero. This coefficient would have been a little bit more complicated, but the end result is not gonna change. So I'm just gonna keep b non-zero in this vanishing term in front, and I can set b to zero everywhere else. However, again, I could have repeated the story by keeping b non-zero everywhere, and it would have worked exactly in the same way. So at this point, we were able to perform standard borel kahn media resummation. So, we took this asymptotic tail and resum it using some lateral resummation. And note that now the Borel transform is very simple. It's just a rational function. And then the Stokes automorphism is very simple. This is just a second order form. You can compute it and we added in here just the median resummation. Exponential suppressed term and then just the rest you at the pole. This term in here we were able to rewrite it in this simple way, which looks like just a single instanton. However, remember, we still have the sum over m outside. So you see, whenever we encounter this sort of objects, zeta, zeta, zeta over zeta, and actually we have seen it in many other cases uh, with Gleb, Arutunov, and Sergei, and also in another paper with Axel. So whenever we have this sort of coefficients, it's always better to rewrite them in the Dirichlet series. The Borel transform becomes very simple. And from the point of view of the shifted coupling, it looks like we just have one instanton. We do have infinitely many instantons, but morally, well, not even morally, they're just resummed by the Dirichlet series. So we really have infinitely many instantons. However, by getting rid of this uh, zeta coefficient, we actually can make it look like a single instant on sector, but then sum over infinitely many. So we are in some certain sense, when we're using this Dirichlet series, we are untangling all the instant on sectors just in terms of one. And then we simply need to sum over all the shifted couplings. However, we still have this plus or minus i sine pi b, the Stokes constant. So um, in this case, we made a hypothesis that the Stokes constant um, exponentiates. So this trans series parameter, the imaginary part is fixed by the reality of the resummation. The real part, we said, oh, this parameter is gonna become e to the plus or minus i pi b. We have checked it numerically in the case of Lumber series, um, and we have checked it analytically both in the case of the Lumber series, which I'm gonna be maybe mentioning towards the end, and also in all these cases of modular graph function, higher derivative corrections. And it seems like this um, hypothesis is justified. Uh, let me, I have some justification. If you want, ask me at the end, uh, I can tell you a bit more about this uh, hypothesis. So for the moment, let me work with the, this hypothesis that the trans series parameter, the imaginary part is fixed. The real part is actually combined in this way. So with this hypothesis, if I send the parameter b to zero, this auxiliary parameter, the asymptotic series truncate to the, um, actually in here I'm just studying the tail, so the asymptotic series goes to zero, but the non-perturbative terms remains. So the non-perturbative contribution in the zero mode 
takes this form in here. It's an infinite sum over integers m, some divisor sigmas, infinitely many instanton anti instanton coefficient. And this is the case of C311, and it reproduces some results. Oh, sorry. It reproduces some results uh, of Docker and Duke, where they were actually able to compute these non perturbative terms in a completely different way. And uh, it also matches the results uh, for the higher derivative corrections. So, again, I would like to stress that I keep on calling them instanton anti instantons um, in the space time point of view, where we are really dealing with higher derivative corrections. These are really the instanton anti the instanton pairs. So the non perturbative corrections in the instanton anti instanton sector are entirely captured by the asymptotic truncating perturbative expansion. But we have to do this Cheshire Cat resurgence business. So in the final five minutes, I wanted to mention another example is slightly uncorrelated, or for many of you, it's going to look like slightly uncorrelated from what I just said, but it's actually uh, very much related. And um, it's, it's a nice example uh, related to lumber series. So um, again, with Axel, uh, we studied this object in here, which is uh, called a lumber series. So you just fix a parameter s. We are summing k to the minus s, q to the k divided by 1 minus q to the k. And this sum can be written in many different ways. In particular, we can write it as a Q series sigma minus s, the same divisor sigma as before, Q to the n. And the reason to do that is because uh, this object in here, uh, for the one of you who know about uh, uh, holomorphic Eisenstein series, this object looks closely related to um, an holomorphic Eisenstein series. Well, actually, it turns out um, that this object in here, we actually study a more general class of objects of this form, can be recast in, form, in the form of an iterated integral of an Eisenstein series. So these objects in here are very beautiful mathematical objects which are appearing in the context of uh, one-loop open string amplitudes. And uh, there is a connection between open strings and closed strings, uh, these iterated integrals and the objects I described before. But uh, for you, this is just another example of uh, um, asymptotic expansion that we're going to try to get. So the key point, as I was saying, is we would like to try and understand the asymptotic expansion when this Q parameter, which actually I'm going to be writing as e to the 2 pi i tau, tends to 1. So tau going to 0 in the upper plane. And the way we did it is to realize that actually this series in here can be rewritten once again as an infinite series of a function e to the 2 pi n times the coupling. So we apply Xavier's trick, and something really nice happens. Whenever s is an odd integer, which is actually the relevant case physically, so when we really are talking about iterated integrals of holomorphic Eisenstein series, the asymptotic expansion of this object becomes of this form, a perturbative part which is truncating. And by applying something very similar to what I told you before, so we're going to get some zeta-valued coefficient. We use the Dirichlet series. We do Cheshire cut resurgence. The non-perturbative corrections takes this very nice form. They are written exactly in the same way as our original series. There is a tau to the m minus 1 in front. But then the non-perturbative correction can be rewritten exactly in terms of ls, where simply the parameter tau has now become minus 1 over tau, which is just the s-dual transformation. So if the perturbative part were to be 0, this would really tell us that this function ln is a modular function of weight 1 minus n. However, they are not 0. But the interesting thing is that the non-perturbative terms, which we capture using Cheshire resurgence, are exactly written in terms of the s dual, excuse me, the S dual transformation of the same object that we started. So good, um, let me conclude. Um, I'm also up with time. So um, in this talk, I told you a little bit about the use of Poincaré series um, combined with this differential equation to try and understand the taylor laurent part of these modular graph functions and higher derivative correction, what I call the perturbative expansion. 
something that I did not mention at all, but we are uh, actually working on that. Um, there is some very interesting numerology going around. So I did mention that you get these uh, zeta values um, in the coefficients, uh, and there is some pretty beautiful mathematics and physics going on between open and closed strings amplitude, zeta values, multiple zeta values, and single value prescriptions. Um, the thing that we thought it was particularly nice is the use of this Dirichlet series. So whenever our perturbative coefficients are factorially growing, but they're also containing some, let's say, number theoretical objects, like this ratio of zetas, it's always better to rewrite it in the Dirichlet series form, because then the Borel transform becomes way simpler, and we basically have a single instanton that becomes infinitely many when we sum Dirichlet series. In all of these cases, there is some Cheshire cut resurgence at play. Um, we can really read the non-perturbative corrections in all of the cases I told you about. Modulo this trans-series parameter exponentiation. And finally, I wanted to mention this uh, Lambert series correction just because um, I thought it was very nice that um, the non-perturbative corrections, what we usually would call instant on anti instant on, are actually crucial to reproduce the expected modularity properties. As I told you, this object, this LS, are not modular, but there is a theory developed by Brown on the theory of iterated integrals. They do have some well-defined modularity transformation. The non-perturbative terms are crucial for this transformation. The perturbative expansion in this case can be thought of as the actually period polynomials of some modular form, while the non-perturbative contribution are really the S-dual transformation of the original function. And uh, I don't know if this is true, but uh, there is a paper by uh, Sergei, Francesca Ferrari, and Miranda Chang, and a few others, apologies to the few others, where actually a very similar story happens for Chern Simons as well. So I'm not sure if this is what Sergei is gonna be talking about, but I would suggest you have a look at their paper for sure. So that is all, uh, thank you. Thank you, Daniele, it's a very nice talk. Uh, and we have now plenty of time also for Talk for, for questions as well. Um, I can see there's already one question. Uh, Sergey, uh, Sergey Gukov, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very for a very nice talk. I have a quick question um, about this uh, Laplace equation with the source term S mm -hmm. uh, that you mentioned in the beginning. How crucial was that uh, throughout the whole story? In other words, could we go through all of this uh, without this Laplace equation, or was it really playing an important role conceptually? Excellent question. So, um, yes, yeah, so we needed this Laplace equation actually to construct the seed. So we really solved the Laplace equation for the seed. We can really do um, a Fourier mode decomposition and solve it case by case. Um, otherwise, like, for example, for the Lambert series discussion that I told you at the end, um, we don't have an analog of the Laplace equation. Um, to begin with. So we started with the Q series uh, and studied uh, the asymptotic expansion of that object. Um, but for modular graph functions, no, for the moment, uh, uh, in few cases, you can actually try and understand the uh, lattice sum. Uh, so for example, uh, there is a result uh, in, in the easiest case in which, uh, uh, what is it? Good. So in the easy case in which, suppose that this six were to be a two as well, this would be C111. And actually, Don Zagier, using really the lattice sum, was able to prove that this object is actually E3. But otherwise, the lattice sum, at least to me, it's a, it's a very difficult object to study. And for sure, in the higher derivative corrections, um, apart from the recent work by Michael Green and collaborators, uh, the only one I knew, the only method I knew was to use the Laplace equation. In, uh, in the recent work, actually, um, Green and collaborator were able to obtain these coefficients really from Nekrasov partition function, uh, taking derivative with respect to some parameter of Nekrasov partition function and so on. Not, not only Nekrasov, sorry, the full n equal to two star actually partition function. But otherwise, I wouldn't know how to study these objects without the Laplace equation, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, other questions? I do have a question. Uh, yeah. Okay, while well, I wait for other people. So, uh, how you propose the particular deformation, how is it that changing that deformation uh, yeah. changes the sum that you've used, the additional sum that you use afterwards? Excellent. 
So, um, good. So, we actually studied this general seed. The reason why we studied this seed is because we saw that in all these cases, you could always write the correct seed as a linear combination of objects of this form. So, we thought, oh, let's start this object. In here, you see that this parameter A, B, and R appear in the, um, in, the, in the object that you want to compute the asymptotic series. And the interesting thing is actually, if we repeat the story with the deformed seed, this sign, it's always there. So it, it, it's actually pretty nice. So the Borel transform has two terms, one with a singularity in the positive line and one in the singularity in the negative line. If you look at the term with the singularity in the positive line, then a very particular combination of these parameters appear. So I think, if I remember correctly, in general, for a seed like this, you're going to find sine pi um, a plus b, or something like that. So you could deform either the index of the divisor sigma or this parameter in here. And uh, uh, thanks to your question, yes. So I, I can say a little bit more. So. The reason why I put this deformation is just because it's easier to present. I think the more relevant one would be really to deform the index of this sigma, just because it directly relates to a, a, um, a deformation in the differential equation. So this index, A, it's really the index appearing, let me see if I have the equation somewhere, yes. This index A directly relates to the index of the non-holomorphic Eisenstein series appearing in here. So deforming that one would correspond to a deformation of this one. And my guess is that the, the exponentiation of the trans series parameter appears because if you consider the proper deformation of this equation, then with the use of some boundary condition, it's going to fix for you also the real part of the trans series parameter to be the predicted one. But I just presented that deformation just because it's the easiest one uh, to plot it, uh, the, the, um, this deformation by parameter B in here. Okay, I was just, yeah, I was just wondering whether the things did change and uh, why it was yeah, particular. Absolutely, yeah, so basically all, all of these parameters are appearing uh, in the expression that I wrote uh, here. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we have an, ex actually, we do have, uh, in our paper, we have a, a general expression for the asymptotic expansion for any A, B, and R. And it's always, so generically, shoot randomly A and B, the expression is asymptotic. It's only for some supersymmetric point that it becomes truncating. So we have another question by Gerald Dunn. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Thanks. Hi, Daniele. Hi, Gerald. Could, could you go to the last uh, slide, the one about yeah. the lab, Lambeth? Uh, or yeah. Maybe not the last slide. Yeah. So now that you see this structure of summing over these non-perturbative terms, can you run the argument backwards? Can you propose this sum over these exponentials and then fix the coefficients in terms of these divisor functions by imposing some modularity condition? Is that strong Ooh. enough to fix those? Good so actually this was and the starting point uh, that, uh, uh, because- The question applies also to the previous example. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, that's a good question. The short answer is I don't know, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if modularity is strong enough to, um, so I can actually, probably the answer is no. Um, the reason is that um, we can repeat the same story for S not an integer. The perturbative series is not, as, is not truncating anymore. It's asymptotic. Mm -hmm. okay. However, you can still resum it and we still get this object. We get that LM is some analytic function in a certain wedge of the complex plane plus the S dual part. Mm -hmm. So, I would not call this object uh, modular by any means, just because you really, uh, you really have this, this sort of, what is in some cases called the modularity gap. Um, yeah, no, I don't mean strict modularity. I mean yeah, knowing yeah, yeah. something about the behavior under a modular transformation should provide pretty strong constraints on those Absolutely. coefficients. The Absolutely. question is, does, yeah. it, does it fix them completely or not? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I would say probably not. Um, so in here, it's really crucial that we are using um, 
So you see, you could say, okay, let me start with a, a, a more generic Q series. I'm just starting again with a Q series with some coefficient a m q to the m. Um, and then I'm asking myself, what is the behavior uh, at the origin, tau goes to zero? Now, I don't think there is any reason to expect the behavior for any generic Q series, the behavior to the origin, to be related to the behavior uh, at infinity. But you're saying, suppose that I'm asking, suppose that I'm saying, oh, well, there's got to be some non-perturbative terms uh, with some weight. Does this give me some uh, condition on the coefficients? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't know the answer. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. Um, so, any other questions? So we have, Gerald, do you still have a question or just, no, just one, sorry. Um, uh, there is, I, I still have another question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in terms of the, the medium summation, so mm -hmm. does, 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 does Stokes parameter depend on B? In the end, because you say you fix the imaginary part, so and Good. you fix excellent, this. excellent question. Thank you, Ness. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, unfortunately, in this case, as I was telling you, we don't really have uh, um, the uh, the origin of this deformation from the uh, yeah. from the differential the equation. equation point of view. Yeah. However, you you for the the yeah, but for the Lambert series, we do. And what we have seen is that over there, nobody forces you to to put s to be an odd integer. So this Q series you can sum it perfectly nicely. Like this has radius of convergence one. So the only point is exactly when you go close to rational roots of unity. So what we did numerically, we actually uh, predicted the trans series parameter to be again, uh, I think to match it with this one, I think the trans series parameter we predicted to be e to the plus or minus <laughs> i pi um, s plus a half or something like that. So that when s is an odd, it reduces to plus or minus one. But when S is not an odd number, it's just some constant, it's just some complex number. So what we did, we played numerically with the Lambert series, we resum it, and then we used the lateral resummation plus the trans series parameter, and we saw that it was matching numerically with extremely good accuracy, yeah. So that, that was actually one of the way why we, we felt a little bit more confident about this hypothesis. Because precisely as you pointed out, the trans series parameter uh, is there, so you, you know what it is, you know the dependence from A and B. The problem is that uh, we don't have a numerical way to check uh, in, uh, in the case I presented you before, just because we don't have a, a, a differential equation origin for our deformation. But in the case of the Lambert series, we do. We don't even need the, the, the differential equation. I'm giving you this Q series. You can evaluate it numerically for any values of S and any value of Q within the unit circle. We computed this guy and we compared it against the numerical resummation of the asymptotic series plus the trans series parameter, which is now a complex number. And we saw that it was matching precisely. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, we still have time for a couple more questions, meaning I can keep on asking because <laughs> I still have a couple more. No, we have one more, but I don't think I should. Uh, so Daniel Thompson, uh, is the next person you cannot, um, yeah, you did it already. Hey, Daniel. Um, hey, Dan, how's like, it going? Uh, quick, quick question. You focused on the topologically trivial sector. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any machinery here that allows you to move <laughs> sideways into other uh, topological Excellent question. Yes, yes. So the differential equation, of course, is going to allow you to move. Because, you see, the differential equation, the Laplacian, uh, what is the Laplacian? Um, do, do, do. Here we go. The Laplacian contains a derivative in tau one. So of course, now if you plug in a, a Fourier mode decomposition, now you should be able to move between different topological sectors. Absolutely. So I should mention that there is so there is a formula similar to uh, this one for the non-zero Fourier modes. And we would have thought at the beginning, oh, it's going to be very simple to actually repeat the same analysis. However, you start obtaining these objects in this sum, which are extremely difficult to, um, to, to analyze, uh, to, to, to manage analytically. So we were not really able to reproduce the same, the same story. So there is still an integral transform that should send you from the Fourier coefficient Cn to the Fourier coefficient An. 
but we were not able to, to use it. However, what you're saying is completely correct. Uh, again, this is a story that happens uh, whenever you have this sort of additional structure on top of resurgence. So you see, we use resurgence to actually predict the non-perturbative corrections, but now I also have some TT star type of equation. Well, in this case, they're not really TT star, they're just literally Laplacian. Right. And now the action of the Laplacian on one topological sector should make you move, let's say, vertical, sorry, horizontally on the um, resurgence triangle. Yeah, we have not done it though, yeah, absolutely. Oops. Sorry, I did something strange to... Um, so, more questions? One more question? I'll have one more question, but... Uh, Please. Okay, so I, I, I have one more question. So, the, the big expression for A0... Yeah. Uh, um, which... I mean, it's it's Good. it's quite impressive that, that 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 you from this you get expressions that truncate. Yeah, absolutely. Once you do the sum in M, <laughs> how, yes. can you, can you could you guess? Is there a reason looking at this that 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 yeah. should be obvious? Excellent, excellent question again. Um, in one case, yes. Um, so again, let me go back to this case, which is uh, uh, the the more field theoretical, if you want. So mm -hmm. these are really coefficient function that you should be able to compute order by order in some loop expansion, non-perturbative and non-perturbative. And these objects are super symmetrically protected. So for this object, you do expect to have a truncation after a certain number of terms. These other objects, uh, I have absolutely no idea why. So if, if the, again, there is no supersymmetry in here. This is not a field, right? I'm just taking the small, uh, sorry, the, let's say, the tau two going to infinity expansion of this object. Um, this tau is the modular parameter of a torus, so this limit is not a weak coupling limit, it's just an infinitely stretched torus. Why should this truncate? I have absolutely no idea. Yeah, I don't have a physical explanation. But in this case, uh, I do. All of these objects are actually supersymmetrically protected. It's a half, a quarter, a eight BPS. From, from supersymmetry, and, I, I really do understand yeah. that the idea is just that here it was just striking. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. So uh, if there are no more questions, I think uh, I will definitely, we should thank both speakers, Maxime and Daniele, for the very thank good you. talks. And uh, I, the next session will be at 3 p.m. California time, I think, well, 12 a.m. here UK time. And if I did it correctly, 8 a.m. Tokyo. <laughs> uh, and well, hopefully I'll still join the first talk off there, but uh, I'll see you then. Thank you so much. Thank you.